All right. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody today? Get your Bibles out. We're beginning a brand new message series today out of the book of Psalms. And uh, I'm excited about the word and excited about teaching. And this is a very teachy message, a very teachy series. Uh, I want to also welcome everyone online and our Bremen location is with us today. So give it up for everybody out in West Georgia, our Bremen location, everybody online. God bless you. Thank you for joining with us. Get your Bibles out, lean in, get a pen or something to type with and, and, and uh, take some of these notes down. Before we get there, I just also want to say thank you to everyone who came out for our very special Night to Honor Israel last Sunday night. Those of you at Bremen who drove in here and those of you that are watching online, maybe you were here as well or you tuned in online, what a special, special night it was. We've heard so many different responses this week from the Jewish community. One, one of our Jewish friends said, in fact, it was one of the rabbis that was here. He said, Pastor, he said, we don't, we don't even know how to receive love like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And he, he said, and the Hebrew was excellent. <laughs> so the kids and our singers learned the Hebrew, song, uh, Hebrew language for the songs, and it was beautiful. And uh, I had another man from Sandy Springs, a Jewish man, come up to me, and he said, Pastor, you have, you have made me feel like a king tonight. Thank you. So, so a lot of different responses and comments, but thank all of you uh, for coming and being a part of it and for watching online if you did. Now, the Psalms, the Psalms, take your notepad out, your iPad. Uh, the Psalms are a part of the biblical canon of Scripture for precisely this reason, to give us tools for living a faith-filled life in good times and in bad times because we, we see the psalmist writing psalms and writing these psalms, and it comes right out of his life experience. We sing a song about that, don't we? We sing in the good and the bad times, in the, in the shadow, in the sunlight. It's my joy for my whole life to give you praise. And we do it in the good and bad. But we don't, we don't base our theology on those songs that we sing, but we can base our theology on the Psalms. And so we're going to look there for, for truth and look there to strengthen our faith through this series. The, Psalm teaches, the Psalms teaches us how to pray. The Psalms teaches us how to trust God in the bad times. It teaches us how to respond to the many, many variables that, that are at play every single day. That's why it's good to start your day out in the Psalms because you're going to hit all kinds of different things every day and the Psalms helps us walk through it. So before we dive into the first Psalm, I want to give some background, sort, sort of an overview of what they are, how they can be a tool for you, how they're a tool for us to use. The Psalms are a collection of how many different poems or songs? Does anybody know? A hundred and... 50 poems and prayers and songs written by several different authors. The most famous is King David. Yes, the David and Goliath David. Yes, he wrote many of the Psalms. But David isn't the only author of the psalmist. So when you hear us say the word the psalmist, who do you immediately think of? You think of David, but it's not necessarily David because there were a number of different psalmists. So when we say the psalmist, it's not necessarily David. It might have been David. It was likely David, but it wasn't necessarily David. The psalmist is always the one who wrote the prayer. I want you to learn that. Get that. Now, as an overview of the book, let's begin with the end. The last five psalms begin and end with a hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, let's break that down. Hallelujah means praise. Yah, hallelujah, Yah means Yahweh's. Let, Yahweh, let's put it together. Praise Yahweh or praise God. So say hallelujah. hallelujah. What are you doing? You're praising God. That's why we say it out loud. That's why we sing hallelujah. Worthy, hallelujah, praise, praise God. Then the bulk of the Psalms are structured in five large sections. The final thought in each section says essentially the same thing. The final thought in these sections say, may the Lord God of Israel be blessed forever. Amen and amen. May the Lord God of Israel be blessed forever. Amen and amen. Now, the beginning of the Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2, 
are a key, I think, to understanding all of the Psalms, all right? So lean in here with me right now. Psalm 1 celebrates how blessed is the person who does what? Who meditates on the law day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. So the psalmist says in Psalm 1, starts it out, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we're going to base our life and the Word of God, the law of God, is going to be the foundation for our lives. Blessed is the man and the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate on day and night. Bible engagement project. I will meditate on God's word. I will know God's word. Meditate on it day and night. And then Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David in 2 Samuel 7 that one day a messianic king would come a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world and defeat all evil and this of course of course points to Jesus Christ so that's Psalm 1 and 2 and so then the remainder of all the Psalms become a prayer book a prayer book of God's people and for God's people who are striving to be faithful to God's instruction and who are waiting for that messianic kingdom, which, which at our point in redemptive history is already. Jesus has already come. We are in the kingdom of God. We can live in the kingdom of God now because Jesus has come. It's already, but it's also not yet because he is coming back again and it's going to thrust us and usher us into another eternal kingdom where Jesus Christ is king and he is Lord. Is anybody happy about this already today? I'm happy about God's word. I'm going to delight in the word of God and we're going to teach it together. Now let me answer this very important question as this sets the tone for our series and how the Psalms can help us. Here we go. How are the Psalms tools for us. We, we know that tools uh, assist us in accomplishing a lot of our objectives. We have tools, tools for building and repairing, tools for, for manicuring our lawn, tools for preparing the food. We have tools for practically everything under the sun these days. But God has tools in his word to shape us and to strengthen us for his purpose in us. God is given us all a purpose, but he doesn't just say, go fulfill your purpose. He gives us tools to fulfill his purpose for us. God's objective for the Psalms is to work his will in our bodies and in our souls. Work your will in me, O oh God. Work your will in my body, in my mind, in my spirit. Look at this quote by Eugene Peterson. He says this, the Psalms are the best tools available for working the faith. 150 carefully crafted prayers that deal with the great variety of operations that God carries on in us and attend to all the parts of our lives that are at various times and in different ways rebelling and trusting, hurting and praising. In other words, the Psalms are a tool for building your faith in all of life. No matter, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter your emotional condition, it's your go-to book. It's your go-to book. When I've had this hit me or that come at me or that person hurt me or that struggle or that pain, it's my go-to book. How many of you have some go-to things you go to? Some of you got some go-to food or you got some go-to songs or you... you you got a go-to, you got a go-to sweatshirt. You just got some go-to stuff, but, but we need a go-to book. We need some go-to prayers. And when I was a small boy, and it's interesting to me that I remember this. I noticed my dad was reading his Bible one morning. And I remember 50 plus years later, I remember asking him this question. What are you doing? What are you reading? He said, I'm reading the Psalms. I remember him telling me this. He said, David, and it may have said Davy, <laughs> I admit, but he said, I read five Psalms every morning. Ah, I remember that 50 some years later. Yeah. I said, 
he said, and one Proverbs, one chapter of Proverbs every day. Psalms were his tool for faith. He read five of them every morning. You know why he read five? Because if he read five every morning, he'd read through Psalms every month. He read one proverb, one chapter of Proverbs every morning. Why? Because he'd read through the book of Proverbs every month. And he'd read Psalms and Proverbs. They were tools for his faith. They were tools for wisdom to build him up. So today we're starting not in Psalm 1. We're going to start in another Psalm, not just randomly, but I just felt that this is where a lot of people are at today. And with all that we've walked through in the last year and a half, we're going to start all the way over into Psalm 137. Not randomly. I believe the Holy Spirit has us here today in Psalm 137 because I think this is where many of us are right now. Now, this, this Psalm speaks to Israel being in a very, very, very difficult place. Life had changed for them dramatically. So let's read Psalm 137. Are you ready? All right. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, other translations say the willows, the trees, I think we can say, we hung our harps, we hung our instruments of worship on the trees. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Now, what is that all about? Well, we're going to come back to that. We're going to talk about that very, very hard and difficult verse. First, let me give you the context here. Psalm 137 is an exilic psalm. What does an exiling psalm mean? It means it was written either while Israel was in exile or after exile. And, 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 after, and this psalm is written as a response to Israel being besieged by the Babylonians. Some of you know the story, the history. They were besieged by the Babylonians, their enemies, in 586 B.C., the temple of God was destroyed. The holy vessels were, were stolen. The Jewish people were captured and they were carried away as captives into Babylon. And the Edomites, another arch rival or enemy of Judah, were very happy about it. Israel's enemies were overjoyed at their defeat. Now some some of this exile language that we're looking at probably, probably gets a little bit lost on us because we've never been besieged by a foreign country here. We've, we've never had that happen. We've never been ripped away from everything that we know and love. And hopefully we never will. But this would have been an incredibly, imagine it. They are ripped away from everything they love. What a traumatizing event. Not just in a physical sense, but, but in an emotional sense. But, but add insult to injury, this would have been traumatizing at a very, very deep spiritual level for the Jews. See, in the ancient world, your country and your God were essentially synonymous. And to separate the two would have been unthinkable. That means a military defeat of Israel would simultaneously mean a spiritual defeat. I mean, God was their protector. God, Yahweh, was their commander-in-chief. So when, when you read Psalm 137, you get this sense, this weeping. We've hung our instruments of worship on the trees. This, this sense of total and complete devastation virtually in every domain of the psalmist's life. He feels defeated. We have no home. We've been displaced. Our place of worship has been destroyed. Our worship has actually been taken from us. 
So we've hung up our harps on the trees and we're weeping. I mean, can you feel the sense of loss for the Jews? So traumatic, so devastating. Now, as you read every psalm through all 150 psalms, this, this right here is a great question for you to ask. It's the same question that we should ask when we do our Bible reading. And that is this, what could this possibly mean for me? What does this mean for us? What does God want me to learn from this? That, that's a hard question reading these nine verses. I mean, especially because most of us are not Jewish and we've certainly not been exiled. But remember this, write this down. The Bible is not written to us but it is written for us. God's word is for us. So even though we've not experienced the same similar, uh, the same situations as people in scripture, we absolutely have experienced similar things. We've experienced loss, we've experienced devastation, we've experienced displacement possibly. Maybe you've been forced out of your home. Or maybe you've been away from your family for a variety of reasons. Uh, we've got a family at our Dunwoody church, our Dunwoody location named Dan and Stephanie Holmes. And Dan and Stephanie have been displaced out of their home for the last year plus because they had a tree fall on their house. Now, how many of you have ever had a tree fall on a home or something near you and you've seen the utter devastation? I was teaching, years ago, I was teaching class 101 on a Sunday night and somebody came over and said, Pastor Dave, you need to come see this. I walked outside and a huge tree had fall, fallen on the house right next door to the church where our counseling center is. And it had come right through the roof down into the first floor totally just demolishing that house. We had 100,000 plus dollars of repair on that house. How many of you know a tree can do utter devastation? So, so, so we got some pictures of Dan and Stephanie's house. There's the tree in the middle of the roof, and now it's coming through the, there's another picture of the tree, and then it's coming through the kitchen right here in this next picture. And, and guess what happened? Right when they were get, getting the repairs finished and they had just a few weeks before they were gonna move back in their home, guess what happened? Another tree fell on their house. So Dan and Stephanie had been displaced for quite some time. I, I think of families who were displaced in 2005 after Katrina came through and ravaged the Gulf Coast. They were displaced. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's awful. Maybe you've experienced loss in other ways. Maybe you've lost someone you've loved during COVID or your marriage fell apart and now you're divorced. And as a result, maybe you and your kids have been displaced. No one plans for that to happen. No one can prepare for that kind of pain and that kind of trauma. Maybe you've lost your health in some way and it's a chronic health problem now, and you can't do what you once did, and you, you've experienced loss. Maybe you've lost your hope. Maybe you've lost joy. And this is why, this is why we come to the Psalms. Because the Bible is so personal, and the Bible is so powerful, and when you read the personal experience of the Psalmist, you begin to realize, you know, that's me. That's me, that could be me. And you begin to read and you see the pain and you see the struggle and then you get to the end of the psalm most every time and you see it turn to hallelujah, yeah, hallelujah, yeah, praise God. You say, well, how do you get from here to here? It's an act of faith every single time. It's an act of faith. Even though the stories of the Bible took place in a different culture and a different context to a different people, these psalms transcend time and space and place, and they are useful and they are instructive for our modern context. So I wanna give you three helpful learnings real quick from Psalm 137. The first one is this, write it down. Pray honest prayers. Man, that's what you'll see every time in the Psalms. These psalmists are praying honest prayers. Now, I really want to skip past verse 8 and 9. I told you we're going to come back to them, so we're going to start at the end of the psalm, kind of get this over with. <laughs> no, uh, we're going to start in verse 8 and 9, and I want to explain what's going on here. So right up here, right up front here, the Bible says in verse 8, it says, daughter Babylon. This is their enemy. The psalmist says, 
doomed to destruction. I mean, he's already prophesying that this enemy who ripped our lives apart, stole everything that was good and precious and holy to us, daughter Babylon, you're in big trouble. Doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you <laughs> according to what you have done to us. Now, what's the psalmist doing? He's writing a prayer. What kind of a prayer is he writing? An honest prayer <laughs> coming right out of his heart. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you've done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. So as a teaching moment, can I just tell you, we don't, we don't just embrace the verses of scriptures that we like or the ones that are easy to understanding, understand. No, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Augustine once said this, if I could just teach for a moment. He said, if you believe what you like in the Bible and reject what you don't like, it is not the Bible that you believe, but yourself. How many of you know somebody that rejects what they don't like? They accept what they do like. And basically, they believe themselves. That means we must deal with the text, even the hard parts. And I think we absolutely, I do anyway, absolutely appreciate the honesty of the writer here. I mean, he's raw, he's authentic, and maybe already he has shocked us a little bit. Happy is the one who seizes your kids and throws them against the rocks. But this is, an, this is a passage, specifically these two verses, you have to understand in context. So let's remember when this was written, all right? So we go back to the context of the passage. When was it written? One of the rules in Judah in that day was what? An eye for an eye. That's, that was the rule. That, that was right out of, the, right out of the, the, the scripture. This meant that if someone dug your eye out, you can go dig their eye out. This was the rule under the old covenant. And in verse 9, what else? Well, the enemy soldiers from Babylon had besieged Jerusalem and killed many Jewish children. In 586 B.C., they killed Israel's kids. Can you imagine the anger of these parents? Can you imagine the anger of this psalmist? An eye for an eye, right? The psalmist says in verse, verse 9, my prayer is that the same thing will happen to your kids in Babylon. But Jesus said, we need to talk about what Jesus said, don't we? But Jesus said that his children under the new covenant must not do this. Jesus teaches us, my people behave differently than that. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. You have heard. You've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. He was talking about your face. This makes following Jesus very different. We don't look like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't respond like the world when evil comes at us. So it's important to understand the psalmist and how he must have felt. So we read the psalm and we try to understand what the psalmist felt. But in, this, in the context, we understand we don't copy the psalmist because we're in, a new, we're in a new day under a new covenant with Jesus. So what was right in 586 B.C. is not necessarily right for us now. Jesus came and gave us a new way to live. Can I, can I go a little bit farther with this? Jesus gave us a new commandment. He said to do what? He said to love one another. He said to bless those who curse you. He said to pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Do good to them that hate you, he said. But we do copy this from the psalmist. Pray honest prayers. God loves honest prayers. He loves it when we pray for our hearts, when from our hearts. Even when we pray something, don't let me shock you here, even when we pray something that is not his will. Think about that. Do you really think 
that when you pray, you have to get it all right for God to approve of your prayer? No, in fact, I think God absolutely loves it when we pray right out of the emotion and the pain and the struggle of our heart, even if his will is here and our prayer is here, God says, I see a heart that is being poured out to me and allow his spirit to bring you from here to here because it's out of that transparent, broken, painful heart as you pray before a holy God that he can take you from here and bring you into his will. There went my watch. He wants to bring you into his will. But what he wants you to do is pray that un filtered prayer. Maybe you probably, probably remember the papers you wrote in college or grad school. Went through several rough drafts, got it all polished, presented it to the professor. God is more interested in your rough draft prayer than he is your polished final draft prayer. Because he, he's interested in your heart. So the Psalms are full of honest prayers. So the first thing we learn in Psalms is this. Don't bring God your carefully crafted final draft prayer. Bring him the rough draft. He can handle it. Secondly, remember whose you are. Notice the theme of remembering here in Psalm 137. It's remembering. We sat and we re wept when we remembered Zion, verse 1. Verse 5, if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. Verse 6, if I do not remember you. And verse 7 says, remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. There is a sense of, of, uh, in which their identity is tied to their place, their remembering, and their place is tied to Yahweh. Their remembering, in other words, their very identity is at stake. And this happens to people all the time. We, we lose something and our identity is tied to what we've lost. And we forget whose we are. I was talking with Jonathan Barrett, a friend of mine, he and his wife, Jennifer, are, are helping to lead the ministry Project Rescue that our church supports through Kingdom Builders, a sex trafficking ministry that's worldwide, it's global. They're making a huge impact. And Jonathan is a former professional baseball player and played in the Tampa Bay Rays organization. And uh, he was a pitcher. But his, his career, as many are, was cut short by a shoulder injury and uh, he, he was telling me just this week, and, and he didn't know what I was preaching and I was talking about this, this Sunday, but, but he said, he said when, my, when my career was over, I really thought my life was over because who I was was tied to baseball. He said, I'd always play baseball, and I was really good. And now I'm a professional baseball player, and my name is tied to baseball, and now I don't have baseball anymore. I think some of us can probably relate to that. Maybe that's how you feel. Maybe your identity has been tied to a former occupation. Or maybe your identity was tied to your spouse who's no longer here. Or maybe your identity was tied to a former place or something else that you've lost. This, this here, I think, is the cry of the psalmist in 137, that they wouldn't forget who they belong to, that this catastrophic event wouldn't change their view of whose they were and whose they are. God had told them, I will be your God and you will be my people. And that didn't change one iota when you were ripped away from your home and you were whipped, ripped away from your place of worship. And for the Israelites, their land, their land their land had always been a physical manifestation of God's faithfulness to his word, that he was their God. But now without their land, now without Jerusalem, now without their temple and articles of worship, their identity had also been taken from them. But I want you to know, and I want you to hear this loud and clear, in times of loss, Whose you are can never be taken from you. 
We are children of the Most High God. Say it with me. I am a child of the Most High God. If you are a follower of Jesus, I am a child of the Most High God. Tell you, if you're sitting next to your spouse, take their hand and say, we are children of the Most High God. We are His. He is mine. His banner over us is love. It doesn't matter what we've walked through or what's been taken from us or what loss we've experienced. I know whose I am today. The psalmist says in captivity, we're not going to forget whose we are. We remember Zion. We're not going to forget Jerusalem. If I don't remember you, let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. Try that. Try to praise out loud with your tongue stuck to the roof of your mouth. Write this down. When we remember whose we are, we won't forget who we are. So the psalmist is teaching us to pray honest prayers, remembers who, remember whose you are, and then finally this. Everybody watching online, everybody at our Bremer location, get this right here. The psalmist, this is what we learn. Don't stop singing. <laughs> no matter what's been taken from you, no matter what loss you've experienced, don't stop singing. Look at your neighbor and say, don't stop singing don't stop look at verses two through four there on the poplars or on the trees we hung our harps for there our captors asked us for songs our tormentors demanded songs of joy they said sing us one of the songs of zion how can we sing how can we sing the songs of the lord while in a foreign land. Now, now, if I could take a moment, these, these, these few verses are interesting to me. I want you to lean in here because so many of us, I think, are here right now. Now, you can interpret these verses two different ways. You can read it and you can come to the conclusion that Israel's just kind of thrown in the towel. It's over. No more singing. The songs of worship, they've gone away. How are we going to praise God now? How are we going to praise Yahweh now? And they've hung up their hearts, harps. They've put their instruments away. I guess maybe to put it in our modern context, praise and worship? <laughs> are you kidding? Yeah. Now, after all of this, after all we've walked through, after all the pain our family has suffered, praise God, sing to the Lord with all that's going on in my life right now, with all that I'm suffering, you, you really want me to off, offer my service to the Lord as an act of worship? Really? Have you not noticed? I hung up my harp. Have you not noticed as bad as it was? I said, that's it. I've hung up my harp. Well, that's one, one way to read Psalm 137. I get that. Or you can read it this way. That these, these Jewish people said, we're not singing, but we're not singing. We've hung up our harps as an act of defiance of what our enemies have asked us to do or told us to do. In fact, many Bible commentators point out that their tormentors and captives are demanding them. If you read it closely, that's what it says. They're demanding them in mockery to sing one of the songs of Zion. Just go ahead. Go ahead and sing. Just see if it'll make a difference. He didn't protect you then. He won't deliver you now. Just go ahead and sing. Your God doesn't care for you. Your God won't respond to you. Now, just use a little logic here. Do you think that these super bad evil guys that had done unspeakable things to the men and the women and the kids of Israel, do you think they really liked the songs of Zion and, the, and what they represented? Of course not. They're not interested in hearing songs of Zion because they hate Zion. They hate Zion, they hate Israel, and they hate all that it represents. They're mocking Israel. So these Israelites say, we're not going to sing these songs that are so precious to us. 
We're not going to sing them here in this foreign land for you, for you, our captors, for you, you murderers, for you, our tormentors. We're not going to sing. So to not sing for Israel here is a total act of defiance. They're refusing to give in to their captors and their tormentors demands. They're taking a stand for what is true and what is holy to them. That's another way to look at this. We see this attitude from another young exile in the land of Babylon. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Not going to do it. Now, again, we find ourselves in a different context, right? Because when we're up against it, when the troubles and the pressures of life are bearing down on us, what must become our act of defiance? It's singing. Don't stop singing. It's praising. It's worshiping. It's declaring the majesty of a good, good God, even in the middle of bad, bad times or times of loss. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, it will continually be in my mouth. Hebrews 13, 15, by him, therefore, let us offer up a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks and praise to, to his name. An act of defiance in the face of defeat is to sing songs of Zion, to worship the living God who is both willing and able to move on our behalf. He's able to act on our behalf. Just like in 586 BC, the enemy wants chaos and he wants darkness to rule your day. But for the child of God, listen to me, darkness will not rule the day because the Psalms, the Psalms are our prayer book for God's people. And I believe that God's word teaches us when we respond in faith, God responds in his great mercy, and he responds in his great love. And when he responds, he responds in power. So I'm going to ask you to respond with me today. And would you just stand with me right now? If you're at our Bremen location, would you just stand with me right now? And today, in defiance, in defiance to the spirit of darkness, and in honor to our living God, we're going to pick up our harps. We're going to pick up our tools of worship. We're going to sing songs of Zion. And we're going to declare that he is worthy, that he is holy, that he is mighty. So, Father, in the name name of Jesus we come boldly into your presence today no matter the loss no matter the pain no matter where we've been carried to no matter if we've been displaced no matter that we don't feel like we have something to sing for but we have someone to sing to and we're gonna sing to you we're not gonna stop singing we're gonna sing to the living God in Jesus name come on everybody amen Amen.